And so one block off the grid, um, once they hit a critical mass in the city, it negotiates a discounted bulk rate with contractors. And that arrangement allows everyone within a certain community to get a better deal on solar systems, usually 15 per to 20 percent off, and the peace of mind that comes um, with a group of people scrutinizing various options. And they, with how the group works is they survey the solar contractors in an area and they draft a short list. They look at each company's history, technology, prices, and its willingness to apply government incentives immediately instead of during tax season, and the likelihood that the company will still be around in a decade to do repair and maintenance on the aging solar panels. They then, they then approach the top contenders and ask them to compete to be the group's official provider in that metro area. And so basically, um, they kind of cast their nets, see what they have available, and choose the best option for solar installation. And then to cover the high price of that, they buy in bulk, um, community by community or neighborhood by neighborhood instead of individual homeowners. And that's a possibility for Des Moines. We have our neighborhood communities here, you know, the Drake area, Sherman Hill, um, uh, different groups that could band together if they wanted to um, as a way to get around the gridlock that occurs um, by going through the local government. Um, so it's an option uh, to consider. And um, this is kind of a side note addressing the job uh, creation issue. Um, I found this little snippet in the Saturday, November 6th Chicago Tribune where they mentioned that the, job, the jobless rate is stuck even with 100, 151,000 jobs added. And I did mention that where there have been um, stimulus packages and tax incentives and subsidies and tax breaks, but the jobs have not been created. And this is um, how they address that. Quote, with debts weighing on consumers and uncertainty, uncertainties over taxes and other government policies in the future outlook, employers have been holding the line on their staffing levels, even as they continue to invest in aggressively in new equipment and software to enhance productivity. So a lot of employers are making do with what they have. They found that they can um, cover the same ground or even cut out unnecessary expenditures um, by not filling um, certain positions as they're vacated through layoffs or retirements or um, job transfers. And so when they are spending, they're spending on software and equipment um, to increase productivity rather than uh, human labor. So that's um, one interesting uh, way to look at the job market. Um, and then, so that was a side note. I'm going to continue on with energy. This is also from the Christian Science Monitor, and this is dated November 9th. If you can see that on the camera. Our role in the future of energy. And there's just a couple of lines that I want to read off from that. Beyond technological challenges, there are issues of energy distribution, economics, politics, policy, and environmental regulation. Um, in reality, we are all working toward a common goal. When the motive is to provide solutions, then energy providers, policymakers, and engineers, and government agencies can move together, um, move forward harmoniously. That's what the article says. And so there's a lot of chaos and mayhem and, again, um, uncertainty and nervousness about moving forward. Um, a lot of people um, are fearful of uncertainty, and so they want to stick with what they have. Um, and then there are other interests that have an economic reason for not moving forward. They're heavily vested or invested in the current system, and to move to a newer system would mean either sharing the market or even a total loss. And so there are some interests that are actively opposed to moving forward for those reasons. So um, there's that. Um, Going back to the Des Moines area, 
Um, there was an article that I did see in today's paper, Saturday, November 13th, Des Moines Register. And it's a small little uh, snippet, but I wanted to make sure to read it. Iowa Power Fund awards $4.2 million in projects. And this money went towards three companies. First one is Avalo Bioenergy Incorporated. That's in Boone, Iowa. They were rewarded $2.5 million, and that was for the building of a demonstration-scale biomass plant. The other company was Ambrosia, and this is located in Ames. They were awarded $1.5 million by the Power Fund, and this is for a biotechnology project for the ethanol industry. And from the biofuel episode, I did read some and show some documents that kind of explain um, how um, not only Iowa State University is very, very, uh, in Ames, is very, very involved in the biodiesel, biofuel, bioethanol industry, but also in sustainable agriculture, too. Um, they're very deep into the research, and though I'm not sure if this uh, Ambrosia in Ames is connected with the university, but that entire area concerns itself with um, prospects of biofuel. Um, the other company that was awarded money by the Power Fund is Indigo Don LLC. They're located in Des Moines, and they were awarded $225,000. And that was to retrofit a two-story downtown brick building for energy efficiency. So that's um, some power fund activities. And as I did read earlier, there is um, talk or chatter or indication of our incoming administration wanting to uh, eliminate the power fund. Um, and we'll, you know, see how that plays out. But, you know, I think it is um, pretty fair to consider how that would affect um, certain industries in Iowa. So on to energy efficiency. Um, this is something pretty neat. Um, we've spoken of so many issues involving transportation and solar and wind, but varying price levels. Um, energy is efficiency is something that we can accomplish without a lot on our own, uh, without a lot of um, money in our pockets, without um, a lot of, you know, asking permission from our our local government leaders. I mean, it's something that we can do and that we actually do have control over, and so it's the first step towards a green economy to a green future. Um, and then to also, these days, saving money. It costs less to conserve energy than it does to find new energy resources. Um, saving energy saves resources and money. For instance, it costs less to insulate um, appliances than to buy new appliances. And so there are a lot of things that you can either do for free or for just a few dollars for energy efficiency. You can seal leaks in your basement and in your attic. Um, pay attention to uh, windows and the joints where your baseboard meets the floor, where your wall meets the ceiling, and especially where holes were made during construction for electrical and plumbing and ventilation systems. And even something so simple as putting in a child plug into an outlet, you can plug an air leak right there. There are so many different kinds of sealants that are not too expensive, um, going from foam strips and weather stripping to aerosol expanding spray foam to caulking to putty. And so that's a first step towards plugging in a lot of leaks where not only air is leaking out, but also money um, is leaking out in terms of utility costs. Um, with laundry, you can wash your clothes in cold water, um, hang them up to dry instead of using your dryer. If you do use your dryer, don't over dry, just remove them slightly damp so you can iron them. Um, and then set your hot water heater to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which should be sufficient for most household needs. And then wrap your water tank with conventional insulation and insulate your plumbing with pipe sleeves. In the kitchen, uh, you don't have to pre-rinse, just let your dishwasher do the washing. Um, and the microwave uses 20% of the energy that's required by a full-size 